APRC is proud to present today, Innovations in Distillation of Essential Oils and Extracts. We're very fortunate to have Werner Besser with us here today. Um, he hails from Western Cape of South Africa. And before we get started talking with Werner, I'm gonna read you his bio, which is quite lengthy. So we've just distilled it to the essential things for the, for the talk. Um, he's got a lot of experience and he's been doing this for a long time. Uh, Werner's been involved with aromatic and medicinal plants for decades. First as a farmer, which is so unique, um, and then as a grower of plants from seeds and clippings for the industry. With his training as an engineer, Werner then founded the Essential Distillation Equipment Company in 2001. Currently, his plant nursery and his engineering business are both situated in the Western Cape of South Africa. You can see he's sitting right now, he's in his shop, um, and he provides consultations and research on all aspects of essential oil production. Um, he does design and custom built distillation equipment, custom built distillation equipment, which is quite unique. Project management as well, because you can't just stop sometimes at the distillation when you're doing these projects. Um, and he does these in unique circumstances for clients all over the world. While EDE was initially aimed at serving the need for information and technology in the South African essential oil industry, Werner is now engaged in the design and manufacture and maintenance of distillation equipment all around the globe. It just exploded. And his knowledge and belief in the value and the use of the country's indigenous oils are reflected in his support for the small farmer and his insistence on sustainable farming techniques alongside with the deepest values of social responsibility for those who ultimately work the land. And that makes Werner quite unique, having a background both in the growing cultivation as well as the distillation. So the goal of today's webinar is to give you a brief introduction to distillation and to show you the inside of Werner's shop. Uh, also to discuss how to make on location as close to source as possible, distillation more accessible for communities as well as making it more environmentally sustainable. So without further ado, Werner, we wanna jump right in and ask you to describe the process of distillation. Um, we have a slide here for people to follow along with and if you could say hello to the audience and then walk us through this diagram. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, the, if you look at the diagram that you see in front of you, you'll see on the right-hand side, if I'm correct, is the boiler, which is the steam supply. Uh, there are various types of steam supply. It could be atmospheric, could be pressurized, uh, could be can, the boiler itself can work with wood coal, uh, electricity, gas, liquid fuels, biomass, uh, solar too in, in certain small instances. So that's the steam supply. That The steam would go from the boiler. The boiler would generate the steam from the fuel source. It would go into the bottom, in that case, into the bottom of the pot, uh, where in the, the pot itself would have your plant material in, in this case, steam distillation, which is that is a representation of it. Um, for instance, plants like lavender, uh, eucalyptus, rosemary, uh, most of your herbaceous plants and some wood are distilled in this matter. Uh, the steam would go through into the bottom of the pot, through the plant material, and the difference in partial pressures would make that the oil that is in the plant material would then turn into a vapor. Both the steam and the vapor being gases would go to the top of the pot where it would be transferred to the condenser. Uh, in the condenser, the, the vapor and steam is then cooled down and turned into water and oil. The water and oil would then go, in, in most cases, there are very variations of separation here, but in that specific one where your oils would be lighter than water. Your, <clears throat> from your condenser, it would go into the separator or Florentine flask, as it is normally called that type of design, which is a continuous flow separator, which means your, it would continuously separate your water from your oil. So, so water 
is heavier or lighter than the oil? Is that how they can separate like that naturally? The specific, yes, the specific gravity of the water is, uh, the, the oil is less than the water in that case, in, in that case of that type of distillation. So your oil would float on top of your water and you would then separate that out uh, by, by this, uh, Jesus, that's a bit more complicated. You would separate that out. It's a suction that goes to the top of the flask. In that case, uh, in certain cases, you have oils that are heavier than water, uh, catnip, for instance, where the, your separator would then be upside down, your catnip and your oil would go to the bottom and your water would be on top. And then there are many other oils that are the, 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 the density or the, it's the specific gravity is so close to water that it's, it's in a continuous separate, it's very difficult to separate. Like myrrh, for instance. Myrrh's specific gravity is I think, around 99 or just over one, and it takes a really long time because it's so close to water to separate. And you'd have to have three or four separators in a row for you to get the time to float to the top or go to the bottom. Um, from there on, you would take your oil out and the hydrosol on the, on the side arm. Hydrosol or floral water, in some cases, have the usage or market, uh, not all. Um, if you look also at the rest of the sketch, there would be a hoist. In this case, the, those pots are either sunk into the ground and the basket, you would, there would be a basket inside that chain basket. And you, once you finish the stilling, you would pull out your biomass with the basket and transfer it to a waiting uh, trailer or cart for, for taking away. Basket goes back into the pot and then you would refill again. They would always, in this case, we are looking from one side, you would mostly have, because distillation of herbaceous materials is quite short, you would you would usually have more than one pot so that you could always fill one pot. And while the one pot is being filled, the other one filled and emptied, the other one is busy distilling, and you would just switch over the steam between them. If you were doing something or hydro distillation or other distillation or, so, or for instance, of sandalwood that can take eight hours or more, you would generally, if, it could be better to work with just one pot because they wouldn't. The, the time that it takes to fill an empty is, is nothing compared to the time that you are actually stilling it. The last thing in the sketch is the cooling tower. Uh, that would be to cool the water from the condenser down and also so that there's no water wastage. Uh, it, 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 it's not always necessary, but it does. Uh, it, there's also a very variety of cooling options in that sense. But it does promote if they, where there's less little little water, you would generally use a cooling tower. If, if you have a, a real problem with the water, there's other other cooling options that use no water. That specific one is an evaporative cooler, so it does lose a little bit of water through evaporation. What are the types of distillation? What are the most common types of distillation? There are there was only a couple of main types of distillation. So there would be steam distillation. Uh, Hydro distillation. Steam is where you put live steam through the material. Hydro distillation is where you actually put your material in water and you boil it and the oil and your steam comes off. There is also microwave extraction. There are which is there are uses for that. There are there are fractional distillation, uh, which would be a further further down the line of extraction. Um, those are the simple main types of distillation. Steam and hydro break, common. Steam and hydro are the main one. There are others, which is hydro diffusion, which is from the top down. There are proponents for that. I have not found that it is beneficial. But I mean, there are cases where it might be. Um, in your steam distillation, there are traditional or water bath type distillation. So generally, in, there's still, and there's still a lot of them around. We would consider them really old and inefficient types of distillation where you would have a water bath and there'd be fire under the water bath in your pot. Your plant material would be suspended over the, over the water bath and your steam would bubble up from the bottom through it. But it's very difficult to get enough energy into it to do efficient types of distillation. But that's how it was done in, in old times. And honestly, there's still a lot of it being done all over the world like that. It's not definitely not gone. But that's the simplest way of distilling. And your condenser in that case is sometimes it is not the condenser that you see in that drawing. It could be a because the steam flow is so low. It could be a, a coal a, like an alcohol distillation where you have a copper pipe that that's turned into a, a lot of circles which sits in a water bath. And I still see them today. They are still around. 
but they don't work with modern efficient distillation. There's just too much energy going through, and it's impossible to cool it with, with very difficult to cool it with coils. All the coils have to be really, really big. You would often see older type of distillation where the condenser is bigger than the pot. Uh, it's it's impossibility. Modern steam distillation, um, it's, it's steam from a, a, a satellite boiler, uh, which, which means just a separate separate thing generated steam with a much higher efficiency, usually at pressure because most boilers are pressurized. It's how they come. It's it's it's, a, it's, it's more commonly used in the industry. So. You would generally take from what the industry uses. It's it's easier, easily accessible, easy to get. Uh, I don't have to build something new. The, the steam would be generated by the boiler, and the steam would go through the plant material. The hydro distillation, uh, once again, the hydro distillation stays hydro distillation. The rest of the types of distillation are really mechanics about how to handle your material. If you have seeds, you would handle it a certain way. If you have wood powder, you would handle it a different way. If you have resin, you would handle it a different way. If you have flowers, which is the, the one, a couple of flowers are distilled by hydro distillation because it's a softer, slower process. And you, you could do it with steam, but because the flowers become really mushy when you put heat it up, it tends to block, it tends to coagulate and tends to block so you can't get steam through it. So it's done in the water where the water is constantly boiling so that they stay sort of fluffy and <laughs> aerated. Uh, fractional distillation, uh, it, it's also fractional, all distillation is to a degree fractional distillation because your if your oil has a lot of fractions in them or components in them, those fractions all have, they are, uh, have a boiling point. So those fractions, for instance, anything from 90 degrees up to 400 degrees, so if you are distilling, in the distillation process, your, your lighter components or fractions comes off first and your heavier fractions comes off later. In most cases, you would have a complete oil uh, that combines all these fractions. But for instance, uh, and this is by chance in my opinion, uh, Lang Lang, which is a flower that is, is fractionally distilled. So the distillation process is really long and really slow. It's hydro distillation because it's a flower. But what happens is that they would take off the, the lighter compound, they would split the oil. You know, the first two hours is, is Lang Lang 1. The second two hours is Lang Lang 2. With, with the uh, lock second and so forth. I think, I'm not sure how far, but maybe until Lang Lang 4 or 5. And that's really completely different fractions, although it comes from the same plant. But the lighter fraction is a lot more valued by perfumers. So somewhere along the line, years ago, a perfumer sat next to a stool and decided that this is how it's going to be done. Not because it is, it's just that someone decided, I like that smell more and I can do more with it. And over the centuries, it has become standard. But all distillation could be done like that. It just isn't. Well, yeah. Sorry, that's a short example from the field. No, oh, fantastic. Um, so we're getting a sneak peek of your shop. And so we're going to take the viewer now to... <clears throat> to see the video of the inside of your shop. So let's go over to the video roll. Uh, hi, we, my name is Van Bester and we're in Rubik Castile where my business essential distillation equipment is situated. Um, I'm going to take you through our, our factory to show you some distillation projects that we're busy with and then also some trials that we are currently doing. This here is a two-ton still that will be installed in Madagascar and be used for extracting oil from geranium. Uh, this specific still has a remote boiler that uh, there will be two different types of boiler. One will be used biomass, so the other one will use diesel as a backup. And the machine will be installed in the ground with an overhead crane for ease of material handling, uh, raw material handling. Over here, you can see the condenser and the separator for this specific unit. The condenser is used to condense the steam and vapor coming from the boiler through the plant material back into oil and water, which then goes into the separator or quarantine flask, where the oil and water is separated. In this case, the oil is lighter than water, so it will float on top. Here we have a much smaller unit that will be used for a variety of herbs, including tea tree, uh, the, the rosemary, for instance. This specific unit is, there is no overhead beam, and it will tip over here with a mounted gearbox by hand, and the tipping would then remove your spent material. 
Here we are testing some machines. I'll take you through the two different ones we are currently working with. This is a socklet extraction that is used for doing herbal extracts from plant material. Uh, very, very various different kinds, including cannabis, which would be one of them. Uh, over here is uh, we are doing a test. Uh, this will be for this is a hydro distillation system, which will be for frankincense. Once again, just to establish the distillation times and yields for frankincense for a client that we are currently working with. A test distillation unit, uh, which I'm going to use to explain to you the process, simple process of steam distillation for essential oils. This specific unit we rent out to customers for tests, for quality and for uh, uh, quantity. And we also do a lot of tests with it in our workshop. Um, the first part of this uh, system would be the, the boiler or steam generator. This creates steam. The steam then goes from the kettle into the pot. In the pot, you would have your suspended plant material, uh, be it uh, generally herbs or herbaceous type of plant material this is more suited to. That would be in the pot. The steam would go through the plant material and uh, take the oil vapor with it. Both the oil vapor and the steam in its gaseous form would go into a condenser where it would be cooled down to water and oil. And in this case, it would go into a simple glass separator, separator where your well would either float on top or go to the bottom. Here we are again with a test still, a 10 kilogram test still. We are going to be doing a test of uh, Celia Zacatecici, um, just to establish whether there's any oil inside for a client. You can see here, we're filling the pot uh, as, as far as possible to the top. Um, with the leaves, okay. And then closing the top to, to get it ready for the distilling. We are now getting towards the end of the test. Uh, in this specific plant, there is unfortunately uh, no oil. Oh. But that happens when you do tests. Um, I'm going to take you through a quick rundown of what's happening here. Uh, here is a header tank, which is the, is the water towards the kettle, and it also controls the height in the kettle so that it stays at the same height while steam is being boiling off. This is the kettle where the steam is generated from the kettle. It goes into the pipe, uh, into the back of the still, and from there on it goes down below the plant material and then moves its way through the plant material into this, the condenser. In the kind of vapor and the steam from the condenser then gets cooled down to water and oil usually um, where it comes out into this case is not a flowing, it's not a continuous type of separator this is more a lab scale kind of separator and here you would have your either your oil sitting at the bottom if it's heavier than water or it will be floating at the top if it's lighter than water if you look over here you will see a sample we did previously and there you can actually see the layer of oil on top of the water. Well, that was really exciting to see the inside of your shop and get a small glimpse into the distillers that you're building. Werner, you are a very strong advocate for distillation as close to source as possible. You've talked about that a lot with me and shared that with other folks in the field. Why is that so important? Uh, there's a lot of reasons. Uh, look, essential oils are generally can be anything from 0.1 or even less than that to five or uh, it's up to 10% oil. So, firstly, you your oil is a lot smaller volume uh, than your than your actual plant material. So you have an enormous amount of plant material that is, is being distilled into a really small amount of oil. So, firstly, it's transport. It's the simplest. Thing. So, transport to transport a, a big volume of stuff is a hell of a lot more expensive than to transport a little amount of stuff. So, that's one thing. And if you out of a even if you go, that's that's just uh, fifty kilometers or hundred kilometer miles in your case. Even that makes a difference here. But if you in a, if you're transporting out of a country a biomass out of a country to distill it in another country, the costs are incredible. So, cost, yeah. uh, cost of transport. Uh, firstly. Um, I mean, whether that comes in terms of sustainability, where if you are transporting anything, there's a lot of... Uh, <laughs> increases the carbon footprint. <clears throat> there we go. Well, to be, that's what I'm, that, to be that's what I'm looking for. Yes, yeah, so uh, what I'm hearing you say is that moving large volumes of biomass is 
making a lot of emissions. And in the time of climate change, where we're seeing so many impacts from climate change, the transport is definitely a factor for sustainability. Is it it also a factor for increasing your yield to distill on site? Yeah, so that, that that would be the next the next case in point. So if lots of plants, so not all plants, there's some plants that transport quite well. They they have no losses of yield, but there's a hell of a lot of other plants that if you if you uh, after harvest, if it if environmental factors makes you lose oil, uh, not just oil, a certain fractions that we talked about earlier. So some of those fractions could be missing. I mean. There are plants that dry really well uh, and don't lose any of their quality. Uh, there are other, other it's, it's resin, which you will be familiar with, the same thing, the resin plugs together. If you leave it too long, it loses some of it. It becomes old, becomes difficult to handle as well. So all plants have a problem in doing it, for, transporting it before distillation, uh, whether it be loss of oil or whether it be uh, degradation of the plant material, they are, they, that's another factor. Once again, it's not with all, but with most, with most plant material, that is the other factor. Um, <clears throat> the next, the next um, factor would be if you are trans, if you, if it's a small farmer and a, and a farmer that is, for uh, in the country, transporting it away from him it makes his income and profit less, mm. which is, it might be a real big factor because you are, if he can do it himself, um, and it's not that technically, uh, people are tend to say that distillation is really technically difficult, or and it's not. Uh, you can teach anyone to, to do it well, and if, if it gets taught. And there's a lot of, in the industry and also in the in the verses, there's a lot of that. There's a lot of perception that it, it's really complicated. Uh, there are people that call that they are master distillers. I can teach anyone to be a master distiller. I think, my opinion. Um, so, and by taking it away, it really decreases their profit. So, more important fact: never mind the emissions and the carbon footprint, etc. Um, those are the main. There's also a lot of small other factors, but mm-hmm. those are the main important ones. So the so the re, the reduction in income for the smallholder, the community, or the farmer. Is really a big socially responsible yeah. ethical issue, yeah, yeah. where there's yeah, it and it's... material at a low price can, compared to the essential oil. So yeah. you're saying that <clears throat> if they distill at source, that they could still sell their essential oil to international buyers instead of just selling their raw material. Because yeah, there, it's got to do with training and training how to handle it because that is that is the case in point that is made by by my buyers of oil, for instance. In some cases, not all cases, where they would say there's a lot more control. You can keep it clean. There's a, it, it depends on where it's done. But all of those things are things that you can train people to do. It's it's and to to, to decide to just take that away just because it's it's uh, it's, it's easier for you or for someone else is, in my opinion, not the right mm-hmm. thing to do. Yeah, it is not complicated. It, the, the 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 handling of it, the 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 distilling of it, the processing of it, it's all things that can be taught, and rather taught at source. Never mind the the, the physical aspects of it, the cost aspects for you. It would also reduce the cost for the for the consumer and the buyer mm. at the end of the day. Mm. Yeah. So it would reduce cost overall, but increase yeah, profit yeah. to the smallholder. Profit to the smaller and to the supplier if he chooses to, so, but that it does require input training, etc. But it's definitely mm-hmm. possible, and it's not that difficult to do. Yeah. So, so I'm hearing you say it's possible, and I, <clears throat> of course, that's making me wonder. Then, what are the barriers for farmers and cooperatives and smallholders to distill instead of selling the raw material? What are some of those barriers? Well, as a, on a couple. Look, the cost of the store is, is the obvious one, uh, mm-hmm. depending on the size that they are doing. So the, the, the thing about distillation or distillation equipment, the bigger it gets, like anything, it's, no, it's not related just to essential oils, the, the cheaper it gets to, to work with. So that, that can be overcome if it is a community type, type of distillation or that gets used by more than one group so that they can band together. And that's been done around the world in any way. All, mm-hmm. all roses in Bulgaria and Turkey are done in that, done in that way. There is a co-op. The co-op has, owns the stall. The, the farmers belong to the co-op. Lots of small farms belong to the co-op. Um, and that's how they distill. Um, yeah, the others, the other problems would be training, I suppose. But uh, and it's not really a problem. I suppose mm-hmm. it's more something that has to be addressed. 
Um, what else? Is, so it's really else? the cost. Yeah. So it's it's the <laughs> communities. It's really the communities having the ability to access the equipment, and so yeah. it, <clears throat> in the case of making distilleries appropriate and reducing the cost to communities so that the distillery runs in place well and without using too many resources is one way of lowering that barrier, right? Yeah. So Yeah, there is, there is also one other thing is, is this commercial and uh, uh, by the buyers of the oil. It's easier to have your control yourself. And especially with essentials, there is such a huge margin uh, downstream from after the distillation or after the distilling has taken place, all from the raw material to the distillation and then from the distillation to the oil to further into the market. Uh, in, not in all cases, but in many cases, the margins are huge. So it, it, that's why in, in many cases it allows for, for uh, a, a buyer of raw material to actually take your plant material out of the country ship it to another country, distill it in a very more modern facility because of the value-added potential of it. Yeah, yeah. So it's not a barrier barrier per se, but it is, that's why, it, that's why it's done in a lot of cases. Right, it's more than it's still that, it, Yeah, it's more than norm. It still doesn't make it, uh, make it more profitable for the, for the guy on the ground. But right. this is not just in essential oils. It's also in many other types of farming. Sure, sure, absolutely. Um, so, uh, so you've worked in some, on some incredible projects, and one of them is called Sense of Namibia. Um, they collect and distill Namibian myrrh, uh, as, as well as other products and other wildcrafted plants. Can you tell us more about this project? Yeah, I, I was uh, a couple of years ago. I was approached by a lady called Cora Not. She she works in Namibia with the Himba uh, community and women, um, and obviously learned over the years the Himba they use a lot of native plants and uh, ochre and uh, the, the myrrh, and specifically the myrrh uh, trees in there so for for perfume. Um, they also use, there's other myrrh species that they also use for other things, but the perfume was obviously something which you could maybe market towards the end of it. So she came to, she developed, the, well, firstly, uh, she got them to start harvesting it. We then did some pilot stills and myrrh, traditionally myrrh is hydrodistal. It's also really, really difficult, uh, uh, normal, uh, well, not, not traditional myrrh, common myrrh as it is being sold in the world. Um, and the hydro distillation, with the hydro distillation, it's, it's really messy. It's, it's very sticky. You can imagine resin being boiled becomes very sticky, difficult to clean, more difficult to handle. And myrrh has an, has an extra problem is that, uh, as I talked before about the, 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 de the specific gravity of essential oils, uh, myrrh is one of the difficult ones as it has a really, the specific gravity is really close to water, which makes it difficult to separate. Mm. or more difficult to separate. Uh, there's, there's, there are lots of other ways to do it, uh, but for simple separation, which you can do in the field, uh, it, you would normally want to do it with water, not ad hoc or other things that you can. In the lab, probably, uh, in the lab, you would, you can, there's a lot of things that you can do, but that's a lot more difficult in the field to get your product out. So we tried out the distillation first on a smaller scale to see how it would work, and it was very messy, but not, not didn't work as well. The yields were took really long, uh, as it does, I think, in general cases. And we decided because it's a new oil, and there's no, uh, there's no. I have to explain a bit regarding that. Uh, generally, oils in the world have been distilled for a very long time, um, and they were distilled in lots of ancient ways. And during the years, maybe only in the 20th century, uh, perfumers obviously wanted, got a raw material or an oil from somewhere, and it was in a specific way. It, it, the quality of was the color, the quality, the, the, what's the name, because it was done in a specific type of distillation that someone maybe did in the field. And that became the standard. And that standard it, it, for many other worlds, I would, if you are distilling, and you're distilling a, a very common oil, lavender, normal frankincense, that's been around for centuries, you would generally have to conform to that standard of quality of the oil. And that standard can have to, can have a lot to do with the, how you distill it. 
So Mer being completely new and novel, and there's no standards for it, uh, as far as I know, so we decided to try some, some other ways of distilling it. So we came up with a steam distillation method with a lot of mechanics change in the still, but making it a lot, a lot simpler to distill it and a hell of a lot quicker. So then we got a really nice oil out. Uh, it didn't have to conform to <laughs> previous standards. Uh, and uh, it's, it's slowly getting into the market. Uh, and it would be the standard. So there we had a chance to do some innovation in terms of distilling a product that was never distilled before. So you have an idea of how it should be done, but it's it's very nice to be able to play with it and then at the end of the day to come up with an oil that doesn't have to conform necessarily to a specific standard. I see. And that's the it, it become it can become the standard. Yeah, that it makes it easier than having to conform. So if you have to conform to a standard, you would generally go to the distillation that is being used and you would you would always try and get there. So you 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 can do innovations, but the innovations has got more much more to do with the handling, the, how efficient it can be, how quickly you can do it, while still not damaging the product or the oil, and a lot of other factors. But at the end of the day, the oil still has to conform to, and it's not necessarily quality. This is the best quality, or this is the only one. So then, it's really somewhere somewhere along the line, someone that dealt with the oil decided that. I like this, <laughs> it's personal, I like this, and then they decided to use it in the product and lots of other people followed. Mm. But that is the way standards for essential oil or what, what, is, what is perceived as quality in essential oils are made. It doesn't mean it's good or bad or anything. It's the same uh, asking, for instance, uh, which is the best type of lavender. There isn't one. It depends on what your market wants. Right, and so and there's the same national variability. In the there process. is, yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. And in the outcome from distillation. Yeah. Yeah, 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 there is, yeah. But you kind of have to conform within certain parameters. I mean, there's essential oil standards that's around the world. And they have, they for, for GC analysis, for instance, they would have certain components that can be within this range, this range, this range. So there are ranges, obviously, because, I mean, it's natural. It, it, has, it will differ. It will differ depending on where it comes from, what the soil, did it rain? Uh, there's so many factors that makes it makes it different, but there are ranges, and for it to be considered a good quality oil, uh, it will have to fall within those range. With a mer, as I explained, that was not. Um, more about uh, the the other the, I just talked about the distillation of the mer. Um, the, the the Himba women uh, who, who who were harvesting it or using it as a, a perfume anyway, they became part of this project, so they are the harvesters. Um, they they are also the still still was put up in Puo in Namibia. Um, they are so they are also the owners of the still or part owners of the still, and it's in the conservancy in Namibia. Which, uh, there's a couple of laws that makes it it, it kind of it's it's it belongs to the state, but it also belongs to the traditional people. So wow. it's a woman um, woman empowered project by by a woman for women. That's wow. the other nice thing about it. And it also empowers the people. They are nomadic and travel around it. it and, but uh, because the country, people are, population is getting more, they have to buy certain things. And this gives them the opportunity to buy things because the world is changing. Mm. So when you built the still for them, did that really change the project? Was that? It, 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 yeah, of course. They, they all of a sudden had a product. Uh, as you, if you go, go to the, the, the website, you'll see they have different products. But it, it's a long process to, a really long process to get any new oil that it doesn't have a, a standard that's used by perfumery or flavor or, or fra fragrance. Uh, but there's, there's standards that there are. So if you, and there's a cast number that gets assigned to an oil once it's been tested, uh, there's a hell of a lot of tests because, I mean, it gets used on the human body. So either in perfume or if, if it's food, it's even worse. So that, that it, I mean, that's the FDA that gets involved. That is it safe? Is the component safe? All of those things. So it has to go through all of those things, which takes years and a, and a lot of money, for it to be for it to be an approved, get a cast number where everyone says, okay, this is a safe oil. I can use it. It's been proven safe. Mm -hmm. So you have to go through. But any new oil, you have to go through that and. It takes time and it's cost. So it's still a long road for them, but uh, look, they have markets. The markets are slowly but surely opening up. They've developed their own products, which is the easiest entry into for any unknown essential oil. That would be the easiest entry into the market. Is the it's, it's it's a natural product, and the, the rules and regulation around natural products are a bit more lenient. Yeah.
You mentioned uh, it's a phenomenal project and we certainly have been showing images from the website and people can do uh, more research about this project. You also mentioned one in Jamaica. Oh, <laughs> that, that's more interesting than, than anything else. Uh, there, there's, to the case in point of the quality of the oil and how it's been done for centuries. So in Jamaica, they do uh, pimento berry. Uh, pimento berry oil, which is a spice, pimento berry and pimento leaf. In spices, they, they would generally use the spice and lots of times the leaf, and there's an oil from both, and they differ a bit. But they were doing pimento, which went into the flavor industry. Um, and the, but the pimento in the field is done in very old bush stores, as I explained in the traditional. They would, be, they would have a pot, could be made out of steel, copper, so sometimes stainless steel. If they were getting, there'd be a fire underneath, and they would distill it, distill it, very rudimentary methods. But the oil that came out of that was brown uh, and had a bit of a smoky odor, and the GC was obviously a certain type of, the analysis was of a certain type. So uh, the, I had a client that asked me to build him the modern still, uh, much bigger than what is normally seen, because he had a they, they were going to do sort of a community where they, they were, all the guys, they would pick up the berries, try it, bring it to a, a communal stall that means a bit more profit and shared, and obviously one, one single person doing it. But it, it would make it a lot easier and the oil could be, um, the, the cost of the oil or the process to make the oil would be less. So we distilled and the oil, the first oil came out clear, um, which we sent away and obviously it didn't conform. <laughs> because of uh, what was expected. Uh, and then we had to go back and do some changes uh, to make the modern stool uh, produce what the traditional stool produced. Otherwise, we couldn't sell the oil. So even though the oil was, the, the analysis were perfect, the color and the, and the smell was not. Wow. So mm -hmm. basically going back into point, it's, it's not you, the, you, where you have to, there's a point where you have to conform to uh, the market. Wow, to the norms. Warner, what's the future of distillation? You've shared a lot of intriguing concepts and ideas with us. And where do you see the future of distillation going? Um, but the future of distillation has, has obviously got a lot to do with um, sustainability and uh, well, looking at the small farmer more than we have in the past, making sure that they get enough of an income. Um, using alternative fuel sources uh, as, uh, as solar energy to a, to a bigger degree, although solar is available. Um, and uh, in the case of generating steam, there are plants, but they are enormous. So uh, there's no really commercial small available. Everyone, I get a lot of requests for, can I make steam from solar? Yes, you can, but it's, it requires an enormous amount of space um, to, do it, to do it from whatever is commercially available. So we are doing work with uh, producing steam with um, a parabolic solar heater on a smaller scale. Uh, once we figure out that, we would go to obviously to a, to a bigger scale um, to, to go further what to find. That, and, uh, can you explain what that, what that is, a parabolic solar unit? Um, so there are ways of, in big solar plants, you would have solar panels. That, that's one way of doing it. And you've, you would have seen in the States, I think in a lot of countries, there are where they would take the, the, the heat of the sun. And there are power plants like that available already. They are just really, really big and, and to generate a power for communities or towns or whatever it may be. So you would take the sun, concentrate the, the heat of the sun um, with parabolic reflectors. That would, that would then go onto a water source where you would turn the water into steam, which is what we need for installation. But in that case, you would have this, it turns into steam. It would be heated up to the point that it would become dry steam, and then it would drive a turbine. And that turbine would generate power in the, in the normal case for generating power. So there are plants like that in the world, many. It's not, it's not a new thing. Uh, they are just really, really large and concentrated on. So, but even with a coal, it's the same with a, for instance, coal power plant or many others. There would always be a turbine, something that drives a turbine. So in the coal, for instance, it's, uh, there's not a lot of coal around anymore. But with coal, there would be, you would, you would want to get heat or your water to a point so hot that it becomes dry steam and that dry steam would turn a turbine, the turbine would turn a, a generator and the generator would generate electricity. But we only want the part where it makes steam and we don't want the part where it makes really, really hot steam. We, we, we're looking for saturated wet steam, not dry steam. We're not trying to drive a turbine. We just want the steam to put through the material. So it, all of this is possible. 
It's just it's not commercially available you know, on a smaller scale because it's uh, financially uh, it's, it's maybe not viable to do 50 or 100 small farmers is not enough to justify developing something like that. So we are trying to develop that. The, the furthest, the further uh, steam generation that we're doing is from biomass, and, and that's also not new. It's just to make it efficient. So um, the French farmers have been for they go boiler where they take the lavender that's been taken out of the still, they bring it back, dry it, bring it back, and they feed it by hand into a into a boil to a fire, and the fire generates enough steam. And that produces steam that, that for the distillation, but they are really inefficient and old. So we are trying to do a much more modern version of that but to try and make it efficient use of the plant material. Because you, with it, will work. Not it won't work for everything. It will, for instance, not work for resin. Uh, resin doesn't burn that well after it comes out of the store. But for nearly all plant wood uh, and even seeds and some of them, you are you making a hell of a lot of biomass. But um, you've got to do something with it. So either you turn it into energy. Uh, which is possible once again, but in the same sense as the solar, it's really, really big. The commercial units available because of uh, to do that kind of development and um, what's the name, you have to have a market that that is big enough that can buy this thing that I've developed and many of them um, to be yeah, able for a business to make a profit. Mm. So, so that's in terms of steam generation. Then also. In terms of water usage, there's a lot of innovation that can be done, which is also not new in industry. It's just not being done so much on distillation. So it's more to adapt it to that purpose. Water usage, re water reusage, use of waste heat, because there's an incredible amount of waste heat generated for the distillation process. And for instance, though, the cooling tower that I said that you're trying, you're making heat, you're putting it through another cooling tower, which also uses energy to be able to get it back when it's cold enough for the distillation. So you are kind of, and that energy then goes up into the air. So there's so much waste energy and not just in distillation, there's a lot of waste energy that can be utilized for something. Mm. So preferably back into the system or something else around the system or even in a human capacity. We have, I remember we had once where they used the wastewater to keep going to the geyser and the geyser gave people a hot shower. That was one 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 thing that we. So there's a lot of those is the kind of, that's more the kind of innovations that I see, and then also just to look after the small farmer and make sure he makes a profit, because uh, yeah, it's, uh, there's a lot of big business that make profit. And, uh, yeah, it would be nice if the small farmer can have some of that. <laughs> Future <laughs> also the, is more in kind of these two categories: the 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 income and looking after the small farmer, right, and uh, giving them stills at source that are designed appropriately and as efficient as possible because the cost is a barrier for them. So that's yeah. why I'm really yeah. looking for these stills that take the <clears throat> least amount of energy, that use the least amount of water, um, and that can be created properly for that situation is where the future of distillation there is. There is. There is. There is. Yeah, there's lots of other innovations uh, which are being done that do with distillation continuous, which work with some uh, wood wood types. Uh, there are micro distillation, which hasn't really found its place. There, there, there could be a lot of it. There's a lot of other new things you can find with distillation, but those are smaller things. The bigger things, in my opinion, is the biggest thing where you can make a big difference is, is usage, sustainability, looking after the farmer, and efficiency of distillation. So where what we're doing is an ancient thing. It's, not a new thing it's been done for centuries it's just to make it accessible easy efficient uh, those kind of things in my team is innovations and installations there are proper uh, more I mean, there's obviously more scientific uh, innovations that can come along too but those are the simple things which will make a big difference yeah i think you love what you do do you love doing this kind of work does, I do. Is it exciting? <laughs> it's exciting. You are learning. This is the thing about essential oils. Never mind the distillation, the flowers, and the plants. I mean, I make plants too. I work with. We we do analysis of oils. We to find out, find back from the plants. How do plants grow? To in a certain sense, if you for in South Africa, we have indigenous plants. So there's very little of it being introduced into the world. Although we have one of the biggest floral kingdoms in the world in the Western Cape, very little of it gets used in essential oil. So we are trying to do a work with that, where you where you grow it, where you where you where you, where you process it a certain way. What happens at growing, at at, at 
at the growing level, at a seed level, at the distillation level, at all of those changes what happens in your oil at the end of the day. So the other innovation, sorry, that I didn't talk about is is where you would have a market that wants a certain fraction or more of a certain fraction in the oil and then to actually having the knowledge boil down from that side and having the farmer distill that or grow that plant in a certain way with the experience to produce more of what the client wants. Mm -hmm. That connection between the client and the and the farmer is very rarely there. There's there's middlemen in between and nothing gets filtered down that down to the farmer or gets filtered back to the supplier in many cases or the, or the end user in many cases. And that would help a lot if the end user explains and helps the farmer get to that point to what he can deliver. So for me, I'm doing that that in terms of uh, 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 plants that are from my country or my area uh, and trying to introduce them to the market. And that I've been doing that for a long time. And some of them are getting there and some of them are not. <laughs> and and you're busy. I mean, you're building a lot yes. of skills and you're really yeah. a good man, which I know that about you. Um, and that's a really good indication that more and more mm. communities and places are moving towards distillation closer to source. And so mm. you're really a, a instrumental part in helping communities and smallholders to realize that vision of distillation closer to source because yeah. um, they need the engineering support. Yeah, because it's such a, it really is, I mean, it's a big industry, but it's, it's the, the, my side of it, it's, it's really not that big if you look at it worldwide compared to other farming industries. So it, it's, there's very few people that specialize in it. So I try and specialize it in it and, and all the parts of it because understanding the plant, understanding how it grows, understanding the distillation, what happens in the distillation and the processing from the field to the distillation. And then from the distillation, what happens with the oil, with the, the problems that get to that. And then when it gets to the fractionation or the, the fractions of the oil, understanding the whole process makes what we do very different. There's very few, uh, there's very few people doing all of that. And that makes it fun too. And that's why I love what I'm doing because it's always new, always innovative. There's not a, uh, there's no time that I'm not learning something new from someone, some farmer that uh, that you would never think, or, or someone else would never think you would learn basic uh, knowledge which is just not there. Yeah. So that's I like learning. That's yeah, why I like something it. new to learn <laughs> about plants. <laughs> Yeah, it's fun. It's it's always innovative. And I mean, that's the other thing on the other side of science, that what happens in science, in, 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 in medicine, in, in flavor and fragrance, it, it, yeah, that's constantly new. And that filters down that, uh, that it's it's what you, it, it's always going forward. I mean, this is an incredibly innovative industry and what happens in on that side of it. <laughs> that's fantastic. That should boil down, that should boil down back to the farmer too. That's right. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah, well, let's hope, as you're saying, that that's uh, the future for distillation. So we want to tell the viewers that today um, is, is a brief introduction. And really what Werner and I are thinking about is going forward, uh, making some webinars, <clears throat> some workshops for people who are interested in distillation at source and want to know more about it to have an online workshop uh, space for that to happen with Werner, which um, is an amazing opportunity because he's very in demand. Um, people aren't really traveling right now uh, with the current global situation, especially not those of us in the United States. And so doing this kind of work online, it's okay, you can giggle at us a little bit. Um, doing this work online and having this access without having to go anywhere to do this online is an extraordinary opportunity, Werner. And I also want to note that uh, this is Werner's first time to do this in a webinar and start presenting this information publicly this way. So we're very lucky and we feel very fortunate to be a partner of yours, Werner, um, at the Aromatic Plant Research Center to work with people like you um, all over the globe who are just driving innovation and teaching people all kinds of things about plants, distillations. So thank you so much for being here today. This is hopefully the first uh, webinar you'll do, Werner. You'll do hopefully many more. And, <laughs> and are there any last comments that you'd like to say to the audience? 
No, it's fine. It's fine. It's also good. I mean, generally, I, the only people I speak to are people that phone me or for information, and also the, all my clients are, uh, that I learn from and that learn from me. So it's good to. That was always the, the idea with what I'm doing. At the end of the day, you get all the give your information over. And I'm a very big believer of that. I do believe that information should be going forward, not be lost with a person. Mm. So all good. Well, and that's another unique thing about you is that you want to share openly information and educate uh, so that people can advance the the industry. So that and and that deep core belief of the small farmer and the, the community organizations having a part in this, a, a more substantial part in this. And so just wonderful. Thank you so much. And now we're gonna switch over to the live Q&A where people can ask questions directly to Werner. So if you wanna go ahead and type in questions, I've been watching them while they're coming in. Um, we can feel 